instead of us taking our process we have right now and inserting AI tools into it, which make bits of it faster, we'll be thinking about the whole thing differently. Can a generative AI ever do that? Does it need to understand the zeitgeist of the time? Hi, Mark. Hey, Graham. How, How are you? you? Oh, that would have, could have been so smooth. Um, I'm very well, thanks. How are you? Good, good. Uh, excited to be talking to you today about AI and creativity. Right. It's an exciting topic. Um, shall we start with a brief introduction of ourselves, starting with you? Yep, that sounds uh, that sounds good. So I'm Mark Rodsheff, VP of Technology um, in EMEA, and my role essentially is to help lead uh, the product development um, from a technology perspective uh, of digital products and services for clients across many different sectors. Um, and uh, recently I've been getting heavily involved in the generative AI boom, as most people in the world have uh, clocked on to. Gosh, what about you? That sounds really exciting. Let's talk about that some more. Um, my name is Graham Wood, and I am the creative director for EMEA, which is nice and self-explanatory. So I'm not gonna say any more than that. Creativity in general, is is kind of um, my bag. So let's talk about AI and creativity, shall we? I think it probably makes sense. We've even got a couple of slides to sort of guide our conversation. Um, I think let's start with a bit of context, shall we, about what we kind of mean. Um, so I'll go first. I think when we're talking about AI and creativity in our world, we are talking about how we can apply AI to the entirety of the workflow and the entirety of the, the creation of digital products and services. Um, and we'll go into what that actually means in a bit more detail as we kind of explore the topic. But I think, you know, the realm of AI and creativity in general is huge and explosive and has lots of controversial and um, unknown parts to it. Um, and the same is true of, of our context, but I think we're talking about it in a slightly more controlled world of designing and delivering anything that someone experiences through through digital. Um, discuss. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would, I'd almost want to add communication into into the discussion because I think creativity is and communication come tied together, especially in the context of, of generative AI. So the interesting uh, question that I, I think about is how, how can we use generative AI to improve the creativity and the communication aspects of, of digital products and services, essentially making them uh, more meaningful to users and more empathetic to a user's needs. Um, and those those two things in my mind come come bundled together love it love it great ad um i think you're absolutely right that's an important bit of of context isn't it um okay great so look i thought um the extent of my prepared slides are a little bit of an overview of, of kind of how i have found my emotional journey as a human to ai and particularly as a as a creative um and i thought i'd kind of give a quick summary of that and see whether it chimes with you I guess it started off with the initial excitement of possibility, you know, going back for me, probably something like two months or so was when it really sort of suddenly became a really big thing and we could really see what we could do with it and start to play and experiment with it. Obviously, it's been around for a lot longer than that. But with that came this rush of, of kind of almost adrenalized excitement of playing with all of these different tools and seeing how they can potentially be useful. Um, and then I think the sort of second phase, this is a little bit like sort of the, the phases of, of accepting, ex acceptance of, of death or whatever, isn't it? Um, that's a bit of a morbid reference. But the second phase, as it were, um, for me at least, was the inevitable existential anxiety that comes with suddenly being confronted with the possibility that lots of things that you do, which you consider to be valuable and a contribution to society, to, to the work that we do, and a sense of value that you have in your own life, um, they're suddenly called into question by the fact that lots of them and increasingly um, more of them can be done by somebody that isn't a you, isn't a human even. Um, and therefore the whole concept of the value that they add, I think we have to re-examine. Um, but I think where I've kind of got to now is this sort of arrival at balanced pragmatism, which is 
I guess, an acceptance that this is happening. AI tools are going to be with us from now on. Um, and it's up to us to make that something that is um, that we have as much control as possible over by understanding it in as much depth as we possibly can, understanding where it's valuable and where the co-creation between humans and AI, you know, the sweet spot and where, and where we can really kind of ride that wave and make sure that we're on the front foot with it. Um, how does that chime with you, Mark? I think it's a really good um, description of uh, an emotional process that uh, I think a lot of people are going through in this context. Um, for me, personally, I I feel a bit like I knew this band before they came became famous. <laughs> so I've been um, kind of obsessively thinking about it for a while. Um, and it was the image generation tools which made it click in my mind of the power of generative AI. So I got access to an early version of Dali um, in beta form and spent loads of time just uh, annoying my friends and family, generating images based on various prompts. Um, and then shortly shortly after that, there was GPT-3, GPT-3.5, mid-journey, and then, you know, there's just been this volcanic eruption of of different uh, generative AI services. And my own, my own reaction is uh, probably a cycle of those three things on a daily basis. So, <clears throat> but I'd say it's mainly underscored by excitement and invigoration. Um, as I, 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 I'm aware of the threats, which we'll probably talk about and the risks. Um, and, uh, but I feel very excited at the possibility of being an orchestrator, a director, a curator um, in building digital services and having generative AI help with the the more menial chores of the job. There's obviously the the later the 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 later events that may unfold that could be sort of existentially threatening, but that's that's quite far in the future for now. So I'd say for now I have those three feelings on a, on a daily basis, but uh, excitement is probably, and invigoration is probably the overriding emotions that I have that's uh, driving me forward. Yeah, I think that's totally fair. And I think you're right. It's not like you sort of move through this and then you get to a point where you're just like, cool, I'm at peace with it now. As new things emerge, there is this constant mix of emotions that you're kind of um, kind of navigating. Yeah, I think keeping trying to keep up with it is anxiety inducing in itself because there's so much media and so many new things coming out every day. And if you, you know, miss a day of like the AI news cycle, you go, oh, God, there's this this new version of GPT, which can, you know, work with other GPTs or think for itself. And, you know, it's it's, it's quite that, that that to me is quite a sort of anxiety inducing sort of pace of change but uh, trying to kind of manage that in a way of filtering and, and being selective in what I what I read and think about 100% you're right even just if we look within the context of, of you know CINT and, and the various channels and and things that we've got for people sharing you know news and, and developments if I go a couple of days without keeping up with just that let alone the wider press and the wider you know world of, of information um, you're right. There's this sort of building sense of anxiety of like, oh, hang on, what if new stuff's happened that I'm not sure about? So yeah, I guess you're right. It's this oscillation back and forth between these emotional states, depending on how much time you've had to to actually invest in it, right? Which is why I think that where we can actually use these tools on client projects and be living and breathing them rather than having to find time outside of that to to explore them, that's a really good thing because you'll feel like in the just in the general practice of what you're doing day to day, you're still furthering your knowledge and experience of of how these tools work and how they're additive. Yeah, I mean, I think that's an interesting point. Being on the technology side, I've seen disruptive technology come along and there's this tentative early phases of experimentation um, and you have to break down a lot of barriers to, you know, roll this out, um, do proof of concepts or trials or prototypes. But it seems to be like, almost every organization in the world is wants to get started now. And like, if, if you're talking about generative AI, then you will get the meeting in the diary. And if you, if you have good ideas, then you'll get the resource that you need to, to, to build out those ideas. It's, uh, I've never, I would say in my entire career, I've never seen such a, 
uh, open arms to embracing a new technology, which I think is is significant in and telling in terms of the overall impact that everyone realizes that it's going to have. And also just how quickly it's happening, right? I think this is the thing that divides it for me from other sort of waves of of, of hype around technologies like um, you know, uh, Web3, Metaverse, all these things, you've not seen an instant adoption of them and that means you suddenly have to go, right, well, if we don't get on board with this now, then we're going to find ourselves massively left behind. And also there's a certain impatience, I think, whether it's, you know, some of our clients are still a long way away from really understanding what this means for them and how they can do things with it. Others, and those I think that are more forward thinking, are already asking us, you know, we're not even having to go go to them and, and pitch and sell stuff. They're already asking us what, you know, help us make sense of this. So I think the pace at which it's just being adopted and and that which at which people want to just get started with it in itself is is kind of telling and also again contributes to that sense of both excitement and anxiety that you've got to constantly really make sure that you're getting to grips with it. Um, that's probably a good point for us to quickly. Uh, and I guess this is a slightly shameless plug, but we've started from an experience design point of view to try and map all of the tools that are currently out there, or at least as many of them as we can. There are hundreds, but as many as we can reasonably um, kind of make sense of and map them against our workflow to understand where in the context of designing experiences, um, these things are potentially useful. And also to make sure that we are experimenting with the ones that we really should be as much as possible um, to make sure that again, we're using them like in anger as it were, um, although I hate that phrase, um, to actually understand how they're delivering value on a real client context or in a real, you know, real world situation, rather than just the theoretical potential. And I think very quickly, and, and probably already, that's what's dividing companies that are getting on board with it and really using it, are being able to talk about their real world use cases that they've done. Companies that haven't are still talking about the theoretical application and the things that you might be able to do with it. And very quickly, I think that is going to become a dividing line of those that are leading and those that are kind of trailing in terms of agencies, consultancies, whatever language you want to use. Um, but anyone that does something for a client um, that could involve AI, which is everyone, basically, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah, I mean, I think the, what I've realized is there's multiple um, angles of attack or approach in terms of understanding how we can use generative AI. The model that I find helpful is I think about two main dimensions. I think about one, how can we use generative AI to help us do our work? So in, in the digital agency context, you have product owners and product managers, you have uh, visual designers and UX, UX, UX designers. Um, uh, and obviously you have engineering and testers. Um, so there are all of the tools that um, exist currently to do those jobs are being enhanced through generative AI. If you think about Firefly and Photoshop and you know the listening of new, new products coming out. Um, from a development perspective, there's uh, obviously GitHub Copilot and integration with uh, GPT. Um, and other tools which are specialized in different areas. So how we how we do our job as we know it now is, fund of, is has changed already because these tools already have these have these uh, new new features in them. But then there will be an evolution of how we do our job as aided by generative AI. So I think how, how teams operate, how teams are made up, there's going to be more fundamental structural changes um, in terms of our, our workflow and how we basically deliver deliver value to to the end customers. And then on the other dimension, I think about um, the products and services that our customers have and how do you embed generative AI into those to make, uh, you know, to, to give the best customer experience for the end customers. And it's a slightly different way of thinking in terms of the tools to do a job. It's more, it's more about like, what are the what are the use cases um, within these sectors and within these digital cap capabilities that client offer where we can bake um, generative AI into, and that's the 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 thinking there. Just to relate it back to communication, is it, it's it's around personalization. I think personalization has been talked about for a long time, but it's always been a bit of a damp squib with uh, showing a bit of content for you know if you're visiting from some location or at some time of day or whatever. It's not. It's never really taken hold but now through generative ai 
businesses can communicate to the customer in the way that they that that is best for them they can use the language the style the formality the depth of information um, that is perfectly tailored to that user's preferences so the the ability to communicate with customers and deliver a great customer experience i think that's that's to me the most exciting thing on the product and services side of things um, and it's all going to be fed through these uh, amazing tools that we're going to embed into our workflows so that's kind of a model i'm i'm, I'm thinking of and for, for sort of holistically um and and we're seeing lots of like mapping mapping out across the across that spectrum in all the different departments across the different those two different dimensions how beautifully put mark you should write a book or something <laughs> Um, well, as a matter of fact, <laughs> well, I was going to say I'm going to I'm going to do that for you. Mark has actually written a book available on all good Amazon. Available on Amazon. Um, it's actually about AI, I think, isn't it, Mark? It is. There we go. Right, I'm going to stop you there before this becomes um, uh, an exciting but perhaps less relevant uh, exploration of your book. Um, so you've brilliantly stolen most of the content for this slide already, um, but I think it's probably worth kind of framing stuff in this kind of sense of like short, medium, and long-term impacts. Um, I think you've you've mentioned a lot of this already, right? But and this is a, a slide that I, I threw to, pulled carefully pulled together um, immediately before this meeting to kind of give some structure to this bit of the conversation. But I think in the short term we are seeing this explosion of tools, most of which I would put in the bracket of accelerators. By which I mean they um, make a task that was previously time consuming or uh, complex faster or simpler through the application of you know the things that an, an ai can do um and i think that lends itself to what i've described here as a tactical integration of ai into experiences right so um if we use the example of image generation and combine it with copy generation those are two tools which make in independently art direction or you know um finding or, or sourcing imagery and the act of writing copy faster in both of those cases, um, a person is required to be involved. For a copywriter, it generates copy, which will need editing and curating, because at the moment, those tools are, are quite good at doing things like adopting tones of voice and assimilating complex content and, and kind of summarizing it. But I've yet to see anything generated by an AI copywriting tool that doesn't require at least some adjustments and tweaking and the same sort of editing process that you know, you'd, you'd kind of normally go through. Similarly, and I've got a separate whole talk on this, which I'd be very happy to point people to, um, image generation in AI um, is is getting there. It's good, and occasionally it produces an image that's maybe even production worthy. Um, but most of the time, it creates images that are either a starting point, which you would then apply a manual process to. So, for example, you'll still probably commission a photography shoot, but you'll be able to generate a really clear and specific artboard of reference imagery using an AI, which will be much quicker than if you were to do it in, in other in other methods. Uh, or you're going to generate an image which might be usable, but it's going to require upscaling, it's going to require artworking, it's not going to be ready to go out of the can. And I still think we're quite a long way away from that. There are also a range of ethical implications to that, which I don't think we need to explore particularly now, but let's at least kind of make reference to. So I guess in that short term bucket, it's like tactical things and also millions of them. And, and actually the energy, as we've kind of talked about already, some of that energy goes into just identifying which ones are good, which ones are useful and which ones to invest time in. Um, I think as we then sort of move into the medium term, I think what we're going to find is as tools mature, a couple of different things are going to happen. On the one hand, we're going to find that the way that they are integrated into our workflows for, for design, for any aspect of, of creative, um, become more mature and more meaningfully um, informed by AI as a default, right? So what I mean by that is, instead of us taking our process we have right now and inserting AI tools into it, which make bits of it faster, we'll be thinking about the whole thing differently because let's use content as an example. The way that content is retrieved and presented in a user interface will be fundamentally different. And instead of us currently thinking about how we tactically adjust user interfaces to accommodate things like language-based interfaces or, or chat, actually we'll be thinking about the whole model of, of how content is made and stored differently because we'll be serving it up dynamically in a user interface which is not static and which has to account for lots of different you know flexible flexible use cases depending on lots of different elements so 
what that what slightly waffly diatribe is to say is it goes from like tactical to just fundamentally by default thinking differently about all of the strands that make up um, an experience. Um, discuss, Mark. How do you feel about the words I just said with my mouth? I thought they're all great words strung together in a sequentially positive way. <laughs> Chat GPT would be proud. Um, but yeah, I mean, I I kind of agree with agree with it all. Um, I guess what what's interesting is how quickly that's going to happen um, and i think it's going to be a lot quicker than we realized to use an example i was at the pub with a friend of mine who's a games designer and developer so he for some unknown reason didn't really know much about chat gpt so i started sort of doing demos to say this is this is going to be the new way of of game designing so i said let's come up with a, a rough concept for a game so we came up with something called race against the clock where cars are literally racing against the second hand moving round so it said chat gpt expand on this idea and it came up with a whole new set of like builds and game dynamics for that uh, and then i said uh, can you you know create the code for uh, the the loading screen or the first level or uh, and it just started you know pumping out code and i was like you know this is going to be how we create games in the future it's going to be about this initial back and forth with the ai agent um and you know i think that that is now and very soon we're going to and that workflow is is going to be disruptive um and then soon we're going to see far far quicker cycles of like experimentation with ideas of being actually being able to use and you use and play 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 it so i think that that is analogous of you know how how quick how what what the changes are going to be and how quickly they're going to um you know become real and what the future is of of um of, of one one strand of a very creative profession um so so yeah it's uh, i agree with that it's just uh, seeing how quickly quickly that accelerates is is what i'm 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 watching and i think this is where it provokes some really interesting and and uh slightly soul searching questions right ideation i think has traditionally been one of the preserves of creatives where they're like yes we like to involve lots of people in the process but ideation is is a a difficult thing to do well um and b you know something that requires you to just be able to think in ways that take your mind to places that aren't necessarily obvious so i think there's a lot of and that's just one example there's lots of bits in in the in the process that i think that applies to when an AI can do lots of those things for you, and even if you'll need to build on it and add to it, it can give you a starting point. I think it forces us to confront the question of what is the value that we add as creatives of any stripe, whether you're you know, a designer, a writer, whatever it is. And I think um, if we look at the long term, you know, I've, I've put in terms of the impact, honestly, who the fuck knows? Like, there are so many possible futures that this now creates for us. I think it, anyone that tells you they know what that's going to look like more than a couple of years from now with any certainty um, is lying, apart from Cesar, who obviously is a man of vision and, and, and clarity. But, um, that, and I'm only, I'm only half joking when I say that. I think he actually has got an incredible perspective on it. But um, I think anyone that says they can honestly predict the true outcomes for how any of this will be impacted in the, in the long term, um, it, it, it's just simply impossible, right? One of those possible futures, which I thought would be interesting for us to explore is, and I think you've kind of hit upon it really with your example, this idea of designers as curators, right? So if we're not the ones that are doing all of the execution or coming up with the ideas, is there a role where actually we're, we are custodians of a process or curators where we'll get outputs from an AI and it's up to us to then intelligently apply our own professional judgment, our own creativity to then guide that along a path that leads to the best outcome. This is an example, right? There's, this is just one, and also this will be different for different people and different in slightly different contexts. But I think that's possibly one helpful way to look at, even now, the way that we take all of these tools and apply them in a way where we're sort of guiding it to an outcome rather than necessarily doing every aspect of it ourselves. Yeah, I mean, I think that's still where we have a upper hand is we we are we can be the judges of what's good um through our years of experience and uh you know creativity that arguably is still distinct from that which you get from a large language model which is based on um you know uh 
derivative patterns of of of, of intelligence accumulated through through its training process. So, you know, as again, okay, as an there example, some huge, there are some hugely impressive words in the sentence you just said there, which I think I understand, but nonetheless, I think that should be pointed out. Because <laughs> you haven't even had any coffee yet this morning. I think that's a particularly remarkable thing. Sorry, oh, I had but, I had I had one and it was strong. So, <laughs> did, okay, fine. So you're one up on me. Karen, no, I think like. And I, I, I see this now in my, you know, just to touch again on writing, um, I, I, I enjoy writing and I'm writing another book and using AI to help me along. Um, but it's not a very good creative writer. It's prose is, is again, it's derivative. It's a bit hacky. It's a bit cliched. Even if you adjust all the temperature settings and like ask the, like flesh out the prompt to try to be a bit more original. Um, I, I would never copy and paste what is written into my book um, yet um, because I don't my, my personal judgment of its output is it's, it's, it's not that good and it doesn't fit with my style and my big, bigger vision um, but I can use it to like prompt ideas and do research and stuff like that which is where it's really powerful and I think that applies to every discipline that you have from design to to software software en engineering so so yeah, we still are the masters, like in terms of knowing knowing what's what's good, and I think I think knowing what's good at that particular time at for for um, I don't know a segment of, of 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 an audience. So yeah, that's why we are you know curators and orchestrators. Uh, but we that depth of experience that we have accumulated is really good because. Even if you're a non-technical person trying to like build a program using ChatGPT at the moment, you still kind of really know what, how, what to, you need to know what to ask it and how to ask it and if its suggestions are valid or not. So, we yeah, we're still kind of vetting vetting its outputs and selecting the best one and tying it all up together into a solution. Perhaps this is an interesting thought then to sort of draw us to a, a, a sort of close. I think there will be an interesting maybe not no i think there probably will be an interesting backlash in that i think as there is more and more ai generated creative whether that's writing whether that's imagery whether that's any other anything else within that sort of spectrum um music is another great example right but perhaps one slightly less relevant to us um the um the inherent human value given to a creative work whether it's a, a any of those things the human perspective the injection of emotion and experience into the thing is what gives it artistic value right in in lots of people's minds anyway um i don't think that's universally you know held as, as as a given but i think for lots of people when you go to a gallery you look at photography you're looking at a human's experience and that is what often makes it interesting i think the more and more ai generated creative there is in the world the more likely that we will see a backlash to it in in a similar way to you know, in the wake of the Industrial Revolution, there were certain movements that popped up which were actually putting the emphasis and value back on the value of human craftsmanship and creativity. I wonder what that will look like in the context of, of the kind of world that we live in. Will there be, you know, certain p players who, who define themselves by the fact that they don't, for example, use AI for some of these things? Will they just be really transparent about how these things are labeled? Will there, in fact, maybe be a, a need for regulation so that things that are AI generated have to be explicitly labeled as such so that you're still in some way protecting a sphere of purely human creativity that can be authentically understood as such. I don't know the answer to any of these things, but I think it's an interesting thing to consider that this sense of progressivism, just like Luddites throwing um, you know, shoes into machinery to, to, to stop it working and, and kind of protest at what they saw as the removal of the value that they could add. I wonder if there will be a yeah an equivalent of that. Yeah, that's probably a good place to end the podcast is on all the many questions that uh, that we still have. I mean, can if you think about Picasso, um, who mastered his craft before he reinvented, uh, well, he kind of invented cubism and uh, you know his 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 style, which was very revolutionary at the time. Can can a can a generative AI ever do that? Does it need to? understand the zeitgeist of the time if it's trained on old information no it can't ever really do that but maybe it, it will in the future as it sort of taps into social media and everything that's happening live now so um 
you and know, all, all of the questions around what yeah. what is art, what is creativity, um, and, and drawing on on examples of the greats um, makes for kind of interesting uh, pub time chat. <laughs> totally. And, and will AI, if we ever get to that point, find yeah. that um, you know, if it if it is able to deliver the sophistication of of a, a, an artwork by Picasso, should we actually then be emancipating it and considering it to be? Uh, a life form on its own. Who knows? Again, I think we're stepping into the territory of, of your books, perhaps, Mark. Yeah. Um, awesome. Well, look, thanks for joining me on this little uh, exploration of, of some of the aspects of, of what AI will mean for creativity. Um, and my baby has also just woken up and started making a lot of noise. I don't know if you can hear that, but that's probably an excellent time for us to finish. Um, so, yeah, thanks, Mark. Great. Thanks, Graham. It was uh, a great chat. And uh, yeah, look forward to, to more at the pub. Sweet. All right. All right. Yeah.